Uh, tonight I'm going to be preaching on the, the, good, the good servant. And uh, it's going to be in, in Genesis chapter 24. And I've been thinking about it. I've been studying it. I've been listening to it over and over again and, and just adding, adding to the message. And, you know, I, I really want to become a, a better servant in my own life. But uh, uh, the background of this, of Genesis ch- chapter 24, is Abraham is about to die, uh, a man of God. Right, right now, Abraham is living in, in the promised land, Canaan. And he's an old man. He's extremely rich, extremely well off. He's got camels, and he's got goats, and he's got donkeys, and he's got camels and everything. He just got so, so many riches. He's got gold, silver, jewelry, diamonds, rubies. He's just incredibly wealthy. And, but there's one thing that he doesn't have. He doesn't have a wife for his son, his son Isaac. So at this time, Abraham is very old, and Isaac, his son, uh, from what I can tell, is about 40 years old. I don't know if you, I don't know about you, but if I was a 40-year-old man, I'd, I'd be ready to get married. So, I, <laughs> I, could, I could imagine that uh, Isaac was like, "Okay, Dad, I want to get married." So, uh, so, so, so finally, Abraham says, "Okay, got to make this happen. I'm about to die. I at least want to see my, my my wife before my my son's wife before she before I die, and and probably thinking, well, maybe I can see some grandkids too." So Abraham, he decides to send his, his, his faithful servant, his oldest servant that he has, his trusted servant, to go and get a wife for him. Now keep in mind they're living in Canaan. Canaan is a promised land. But in Canaan, you have the Canaanites, okay? Now the, the Canaanites are, are very, the Canaanites are very uh, paganistic, which means that they worship false gods. And I'm going to go through a couple of the false gods that they have a little, a little bit down the road here. But uh, he knew that, that uh, if his son were to marry a Canaanite woman, it would not be good for him. Because a woman has a strong effect on how a man lives his life. So if you're not married yet and you're a young man, make sure you marry a godly lady. If you're not married and you're a young lady, make sure you marry a godly man. But they will influence how you live your life and your future legacy. They'll, that, that will depend what happens to your grandchildren and your children, if they even get saved. Because sometimes stuff happens, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little, little bit more. But uh, So anyway, Isaac, was, he was really ready to get married. And I think about Isaac. He had to have been very obedient in order to wait 40 years for his dad to arrange a marriage for him. Now, if you think, if you think about another, another man in the Bible, his name was Samson. Uh, Samson in the Bible, he was living in the land of the Philistines too. And his mother and father said, Samson, marry an Israelite. Marry somebody from our own country, from our own people. But Samson, he didn't care about what his mom and dad wanted him to do. And he happened to see a beautiful Philistine girl. And it says that she was like one of the most beautiful women uh, probably in the whole area. And he says, I've got to have her. And the mom and dad said, please, get, get, a, get another one. Get one, somebody from, from our, our, our culture, from, from our Israelites. He says, no, get me that woman. And he was like, I don't care what you say. I want that woman. See, he was just going off, off of looks. And he was just going off of, uh, off of his uh, high testosterone levels. And he didn't care about nothing. He wanted that woman, which, you know, I, I, I can understand. When, when you're a young man, you got a lot of testosterone, you got a lot of energy, and you want what you want. But that wasn't the right thing to do. Now, let me tell you a little bit. Oh, by the way, Samson, he did his own thing. But if you look in the Bible, he ended up getting married, but then his wife ended up getting killed by the Philistines. So he had a very short marriage. And then... Uh, he ended up getting captured by the Philistines, and his eyes, his both eyes ended up getting burned out. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd want that to happen to me. And then he ended up, of course, you know the story. He pushes down the pillars. The building comes down. He ends up getting crushed to death. So we're talking about two different men. Isaac, 
a man who was willing to obey his mother and father and another man who just had to have what he, what he wanted to have when he wanted it. So let me tell you a little bit about the Canaanites before we get into the story. Uh, they worshipped false gods. One of them was Anat, the goddess of war, Asherah, lady of the sea, Astarte, goddess of love and fertility. And I think if I was a Philistine guy, I'd be playing to Astarte. God, give me some love. Give me a beautiful wife. And then you have Baal, meaning Lord, God of rain, thunder, and fertility. And if you read the tes- uh, Old Testament, you'll see Baal mentioned quite a bit. Uh, it's one of, the, one of those gods. Chemosh, the national god of Moab. Dagon, the god of fertility. Now, there's a couple of stories. One of them is, is in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, where the Philistines, they captured the ark of God. And they says, okay, great, we got the ark of God. And then the Bible says that they took it and put it in the temple of Dagon. And uh, they said, okay, good, we got, we got the ark in our temple. Well, the next morning, when they went into the temple, the Dagon had fallen down on his face to the ark of God. And uh, I don't know about you, but if I was one of those guys in that temple, I'd be like, whoa, what happened, man? Did somebody knock this thing over or? Did an earthquake come, knock it over? I don't know. So they picked it back up and you know, probably didn't think nothing about it. The next night, God came, and the Bible says that uh, the, uh, it was cut in, uh, cut in the bottom. Like, here's a picture of it there. They cut it on the bottom, and it cut both the wrists off, and it fell before the ark of God. So I think after that, they're like, okay, we got to get this ark out of here. So that's one, one of the gods. Now, that same god, Dagon, there's another story. If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 9. Now, this is uh, the, the Philistines. They, they were warring against uh, Saul. And Saul was a very disobedient king, unfortunately. He started off good. He started off being humble. He started off loving God and, and, and wanting to do God's will. But then after a while, he just started getting a hard heart. He started being rebellious. He started wanting to do his own will. But the Bible says that in the end, since he rebelled against God, he ended up getting killed by the Philistines. And the Bible says that they chopped his head off and they fastened it in the temple of Dagon. It's not a good good way to end your life. But you see all these, some of these different gods, they're they're in the Bible. Then there's uh, Eshman, Phoenician god of healing. There's Melkart. The God who is king of the city. Almost sounds like we're, we're watching Shrek or something like that here, huh? <laughs> and then there's also some other gods. They had a lot of gods. Uh, Molech. Now, Molech was uh, the title for the God who is king to whom child sacrifices were offered. Now, the Bible talks about this in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21. It says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed... Pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of, the, of thy God. I am the Lord. So God says, we don't want none of your children going to Molech. That's horrible. God never wants somebody to sacrifice their babies to any, any God. And then also, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 2, it says, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel... Or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So these, these gods were, were, were horrible. And, and, and if you were an Israelite and you gave your child to Molech as a sacrifice, the Bible said you'd be stoned to death. So these, these gods were horrible. And the Philistines, uh, they worship all these pagan gods. Uh, Mot, God of the underworld, Nikal, goddess of fruit, Kadesh to the holy one, God of love, Reshef, God of plague, Shalem and Shaker, twin gods of dusk and dawn, Shemaim, the god of the sky, Shemes, God of the sun, Tanet, Phoenician god of Lunas, Yam, God of the sea, and Yerik, God of the moon. So the bottom line is Canaanites worship false gods. Now they might have had some beautiful women. <laughs> and I could I could I could understand if if uh, Isaac says, Dad, you know, I don't want to wait. I want one of these beautiful women over here. But his father knew that if he married one of those uh, pagan, pagan women, that he also would probably fall into those sins. 
just like uh, uh, Solomon did. Uh, he, start, he got a lot of wives, and a lot of them were, were pagans, and they influenced his heart. So uh, let's keep going on in the story. Uh, so anyway, Abra- if you turn to Genesis chapter 24, verse 1, and the Bible says that Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So point number one, a servant is trustworthy. Your blank, first blank is trustworthy. Abraham asked his servant to make a vow to God that he would not get Isaac from, a, from, from the worldly Canaanite women and that he would get him from his home country. Look at verse 2. And Abraham said to his eldest servant that, that ruled over all he had. So he really trusted this servant. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the, of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go to, unto my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So he's making a promise. Now that, uh, in the Old Testament, they would put their hand under their thigh. I'm not sure where it was at, but it's somewhere under their thigh. And, and they would make a vow. And that's how they did it in the Middle East. They might even still do that now. I don't know. Uh, but uh, that he trusted his, his, his servant to, to do that, get him a good wife for his, for his son. Uh, and then, but I will tell you, that servant, he didn't just say, I'll take that vow. I'll accept that vow. I'll, I'll do it. He thought about it. And he really, really wanted to make sure that if he accepted that vow to get Isaac a son from his far country, that he knew that he was going to do everything in his power to make it happen. So, notice in verse 5 that the servant was willing to follow his master's commands, but he wasn't sure if he could find a woman. Look at verse 5. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I need bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? He says, What if none of those virgin girls are willing to follow me? What should I do? Should I take Isaac... Back to, back to our country. So he, he was kind of asking some questions. He wanted to make sure he was making the right decision. Um, and Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will, sit, see, will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son. So... Point two, a good servant has God's presence and blessing in his life. Notice where it says, he shall send his angel before thee. So Abraham said, I'm going to send an angel to help you. And and he probably says, I'm going to pray for you. And God is going to be with you. And God is going to bless you. And he's going to help you get that young virgin for my son. Verse, verse eight, and if the woman be not, and if the woman not, will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son th- thither again. Point three, a good servant takes his vows seriously. Verse nine says, and the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham, and swear to him concerning. Concerning that matter. Point four. A servant is trusted with money and material goods. Look at verse 10. And you'll see how how Abraham trusted this servant. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, the city of Nahar. Everything that he had... He had control of everything that Abraham had, all the cattle, all the gold, all the silver, all, and he was completely trusted. A, a servant is trusted. Look at ver, uh, point five. A good servant is a person of prayer. Abraham's servant had to turn to God to make this happen. He knew that he couldn't just go to this uh to uh, to where Abraham came from, 
and just say, hey, who wants to go with me? Uh, I've I got somebody who wants to get married. My master's son wants to get married. So he, he knew that it just wasn't going to happen that easy. So he had to turn to God in prayer. And, and, and if you were one of the beautiful young virgins in his, in his country, they don't know what Isaac looks like. He might have been bald. He might have been ugly. He, he might have been stinky. You just never know. You know, so, but, you know, it, it would take a lot of faith for a young lady, a young, beautiful virgin to say, okay, I'll go. And that's something that only God can do. So he would have to have God's blessing on the mission. Look, look at verse uh, 11 and 12. And he made his camels. So finally he made it to, to, to Abraham's country. And he made his camel to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. Then he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. He says, God, just bless me. And back in the Middle East, and it's still like that today in in a lot of those places, uh, the the watering well is where where they meet. At night, the young ladies, they would come out there, and they would draw water up from the well. And they, and they would get water for their families. And, and they would have these big pictures, pictures that they would carry on their shoulder. I would imagine they could probably carry three or four gallons, uh, you know, two or three maybe, because five gallons would be pretty heavy. Uh, by the way, could you bring that five-gallon container over here? Um, so they would go to the well and, and get water. Um, so... Notice how at the end of verse 12, it says, And show kindness unto my master Abraham. He really cared about his master. And he wanted God to bless his master. So a good servant cares about what his master says. A good servant cares about what his leader wants. So whether, whether you're in the ministry or... Put it down right there. Thank you. Thank you, brother. This is, this is a good servant here, by the way. He's so humble. I appreciate that, Brother Scott. But uh, a good servant cares about what his master wants. Uh, If you work a job, secular job, and you got a boss, a good servant would care about what he wants. And you try try to make people happy. You try to do the right thing. Now, look. Now, the the servant, he prayed for a sign. He He said, God, I want to ask one of these virgins and say, will you... Give me just a little bit of water. And God, if she, I'm just paraphrasing this, by the way. If she will say, yes, I will give you drink. And also, I'm going to give your camels drink, too. Now, I don't know if you know much about camels, but they can drink a lot of water. A camel can sit down, a camel can sit down and drink 20 gallons of water at a sitting. 20 gallons. Just, there goes the gallon. There goes another gallon. There goes another gallon. So you can imagine, that's, they can drink a lot of water. I don't know if they make that noise or not, but, you know. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so he, he, wanted, he wanted a good wife for his, his son. And he, he, he wanted uh, uh, Isaac to have a good wife. He wanted a wife that was a servant. Uh, he wanted a wife who was willing to volunteer and was willing to go the extra mile for him. And especially for his servant's son, Isaac. He wanted, uh, he wanted his wife to get a servant. And look what it says here. By the way, if you're married and you want to have a successful marriage, you have to be a servant. If you're a man, you have to serve your, your wife. And you have to serve your children. That's one thing that I, that I really, God's touched my heart as I've been preparing this message. I need to be a better servant for my family and for my wife. And if they ask me to do things, stuff, if I can do it, I just try to do it fast without, you know, trying to come up with an excuse or something like that. Because we're all busy. We're all busy. But I want to try to be a better servant for my children and for my wife. And not only for my wife, but also for my church and also for my pastor. If you're a woman, obviously you should be a servant to your children and to your husband and to the church and to God, and to, you know, so we're all supposed to be servants. Uh, now look at, look at verse uh, 13 and 14. Here's his prayer. Behold, I stand here at the well of water, 
And the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. There, thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. And you know what? I was, I was thinking, you know, it would be interesting to, to learn a little bit about camels. So I did a little camel study. So let's, let's take a little rabbit trail here for just a couple of minutes here, okay? So first thing, could you imagine uh, he, the servant here, he came with 10 camels. And those camels can be very huge. Arabian camels could be 10 feet long. So that's probably from like the wall probably to about here would be about 10 feet. Head to body. Well, there's a picture right there. Wow. How'd that pop up? <laughs> Good job. Good job, guys. So these camels could be gigantic. They could be absolutely huge. And it says, it says that they can drink 10, uh, 20 gallons of water times 10 camels. How much is that? It's 200 gallons. Did you know that 200 gallons is equal to 40? Brother Daniel, come here. I know you're a serious weightlifter. Oh. <laughs> he's, he's the strongest guy in our church. Now, I want you, oh, no. while we're waiting here, take that. Oh, my back. Oh. Yeah. Okay, while we're doing this, I just want you to start doing curls with that, okay? <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. Show him what you can do. Yeah. He paid me to do this, by the way. Yeah. All right, all right. So anyway, uh, I calculate, hey, 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 what you doing? Keep on going. No, just kidding. Go ahead. That's good. Thank you, Brother Daniel. All right. I just got him a free workout. Right, so anyway, I calculated it. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds. If you have uh, <clears throat> 200 gallons, that's equal to 1,600 pounds. That's a lot of weight. So if you could put a picture of the ladies drawing water. So what they would have to do is they would have to get their pitcher and lower it down into the well. And then it'd fill up. Wrong picture, guys, but that's okay. I forgive you. You're trying to be a servant. So they would fill it up with water. And then they would, you know, if you can imagine, you'd have to ring it up like that or however they did, you know, some kind of a thing. They'd get it up like that. And then perfect, good timing, put it in the trough. Put it in the trough for the camels. So then, so that's what she did, basically. 200 gallons of water, approximately. It could have been more, because if the camels get thirsty, they could drink more. Could you imagine that, 1,600 pounds? So Rebecca was a lady who was physically fit. Now, Brother Mark, you want to come and do a couple of curls over here? He's another weightlifter in the, in the church. But uh, she was physically fit. So obviously, she didn't do, you know, you know maybe 20, you know, 10 pounds, did it, poured the water. But I'm just guessing it probably took about an hour to feed all those camels. In the meantime, the servant was, oh, man, I can't believe it. His jaw was probably like down here. And he was like, man, I can't believe it. God has answered my prayer so fast. And he, he, the very first lady, the very first lady that I come up to, she, God answered my prayers. But listen, okay. So anyway, he did that. Oh, some more interesting facts. A camel can go a, feet, a week without water. That's a long time. That's why they need a drink so much. Some camels can carry a rider between 80 to 120 miles per day. So from here to Carlsbad and back is about 90 miles. Could you imagine riding a camel 90 miles? Up and down, up and down. I'm sure your back would probably be killing you by the, by the time you're done. But these animals, these camels are pretty incredible. Uh, a camel can run up to 40 miles an hour in short bursts. Could you imagine it, 40 miles an hour? Has anybody ever, ever seen a, a, a clip of Hussein, uh, a Bolt, Hussein Bolt? Yeah, Hussein Bolt, right? Has anybody ever seen a clip of Hussein Bolt running? It's amazing. He's like, Shh. but he only runs 27 miles an hour. So could you imagine a camel just run right past him? Uh, that's, that's incredible. So these, these camels are amazing. Camels stink. The Bible said, I mean, uh, they say that camels will actually pee on their own legs to cool them off. Yeah, so they really stink. That's pretty bad. Another, another interesting fact about camels. They can swim almost two miles. Two miles in search of food. These incredible animals. And then camels spit. Um, this is the last one. 
Now, when a camel spits, what it does is it, it, it mixes saliva, and then it brings up, it brings up uh, vomit, and then it shoots it out. And it says that their mouths bulge open, and then if it bulges like this, you know you better run. You better run. That's all I can say because it's, it's not good. Um, so anyway, just a little, little, extra, little extra exegesis here about camels. Let's go to, uh, so anyway, so no sooner did he finish praying, and then Rebecca came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Verse 15, and it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebecca came out. I mean, he had just got done praying, and here comes Rebecca. Came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the, the, son, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the Bible says she was very beautiful. And it says she, she, and I was just thinking she probably took very good care of her health. She probably ate right. She probably exercised. She probably spent a lot of time combing her hair. And, and uh, I think she probably even took a bath that morning. <laughs> anyway, it says that she was very beautiful. She was a virgin. The most important thing is she, she wanted to save herself for her husband, her future husband. She did not know who God had for her, but she wanted to stay pure for whoever that man was going to be. Praise the Lord that there's some, some ladies like that out there. Look at verse 16. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled up her pitcher and came up. But neither had any man known her. Now, to me, I think that means that she didn't, she wasn't kissing all the guys. She wasn't, you know, caressing all the guys and, you know, just making out all the time. She was just saving herself for her husband. Now, I know in today's society, it's pretty normal. You know, people hug and kiss and do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, but that's, that's, really, not what the, that's really not God's plan. God wants us to wait till you get married. And then you can enjoy the, uh, the joys of marriage, put it that way. So if perhaps, if perhaps you have not done it the right way, that's okay. You're forgiven. But always think for, think for the future. If you made some mistakes, say, okay, I'm not going to make those mistakes again. Uh, I'm not going to do stuff I shouldn't do. I will wait till I'm married. So I'm just, I'm just trying to be... Trying to be very nice about it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, one of the things I was going to say is, is you know, they, they, they say that it's old-fashioned to wait till you get till you're married until you, you share your affections with people. But you know what? God doesn't change. And I would rather do, do it God's way. Uh, One thing I can say, though, is most guys, they want to marry a girl who is clean and pure. And, the, and that's what the servant wanted to get for his master's son. Uh, point seven. A servant is a hard worker. He's motivated and wants to get the job done as quickly as possible. And look at verse 17, and you'll see how mo, mo, uh, Abraham's servant, when he saw her, he ran to her. He didn't want to waste any time. And it says, And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. So he, didn't, he saw her coming. He was like, Whoa, she's pretty cute. I think, my, I think Isaac would like her. And he just, he ran. He said, ah. But could you imagine how that would look, seeing some guy, some old guy with a beard running at you? <laughs> so she's probably like, Oh, wow, what's going on here? This guy with a, and, and their beards are like, those are, those are guys are real men over there. Their beards are probably like, like that. Big old, jam, big old jam beards. I got a baby beard, by the way. But you can imagine what, they, what she thought. Some strange man coming, running at me. But then when he says, can I just have a, a cup of water? A little bit of water from your pitcher? And she's like, oh yeah, I'll do that. So, <laughs> well, she didn't say it, but she probably thought it in, in, her, in her brain. And Rebecca immediately gave him drink, and then she volunteered to give him uh, to give his camels drink. And, and the thing about Rebecca, she had a servant's heart. He only asked for a little bit of water, but she says, "You know what? I'm going to give him, poured him all the water he wanted." And she pro he, she probably gave his servants because he didn't come by himself. 
And she probably gave all of his servants water. She says, you know what, uh, can I give your camels water too? Absolutely. So she started getting all the water for the camels. So she had a servant's heart. She had a, a volunteering spirit. Nobody had to say, get that water. She volunteered. So she had a great attitude. She was a hard worker, and she was a servant. She went above and beyond what was expected. So this was truly an answer to prayer. And also, look at verse 18, how much respect she had. And she said, drink, my Lord. It was very respectful. And, that's, and, and respect in nowadays is almost not even there. So as, as young ladies and as men and women, we should be respectful to other people. We should be kind to other people. Even if sometimes uh, you see somebody and, and <clears throat> they don't take care of themselves and maybe they're homeless and they're drunk or whatever, or they're on, you know, on crack or something like that, we should still be kind to them. We should still be respectful to everybody. Um, so that's what she was. She had, a, she had a very loving heart, a very caring heart, a very compassionate heart. And the Bible says that she ran to get them water. Um, look at verse 21. And the man, oh, it's, oh, verse 20. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again and into the well to draw water and drew for his camels. So she was like running. She was like, get some water, pours it in the trough. She goes back again, running again. So she was like, she was in shape. She was a hard worker, for sure. And then verse 21, And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took, the go took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands and ten shekels of weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room for thy, in thy father's house for us to lodge on? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Nahor. I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. So basically, she was a distant relative. And of course, he knew right off the bat because Nahor was, uh, was Abraham's uh, brother. She said, Moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed his head and, Lord, and worshiped the Lord. He says, You know, yeah, we got, we got a place for your camels and we got straw. And he just bowed his head and just started praising the Lord. He was like, Thank you, Jesus. He just couldn't believe that God was answering his prayer so fast. So the servant praised the Lord that God had blessed his master Abraham. And he was, that servant was faithful to do what he was supposed to do. He was a, a faithful servant. Look at verse uh, 28. And the damsel ran and told the master these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man. So, man there's a lot of running going on here. Unto the well. And it came to pass, when he saw the earring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, he saw all this gold. Gold, golden bracelets and golden earrings. Like, wow, what's, what's going on here? And when he heard that, the words of Rebekah's sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man and said, Behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared for thee a house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels and gave stra straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. So he was, he was a servant too. And point number eight, the servant had the right priorities. He would not eat until he told them what he was there for. So the servant, he had, he, he, had a, he had a reason why he was there, and that was to get a wife for his master's son, Isaac. And look at verse 33. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, speak on. He says, I got I to gotta tell you what's, what, what I came here for. And he wanted them to know that he was a servant of Abraham. Look at verse 34. And he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly. He was just lifting up his, his master. And you know what? That's what we should do for God, too. We should lift up God. And he lifted up his leader. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And then he started telling him about Isaac, his need for a wife. Look at verse 36. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, 
and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, thou shalt not take a wife unto my son, of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my father's house, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. So point nine, the servant lets, the ma- lets them know that Abraham was a man very close to God and tells him about his mission. Verse 40, And he said unto, unto me, The Lord be whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son and for my kindred and my father's house. So he said, he said, he said My master Abraham, he's a man of God. He's a great man. Lifting up his master. Look at verse 24, uh, point number 10. The servant expected a firm decision from the family and Rebecca. He was focused on his mission. He wanted to get the job done. Look at verse 49. And now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. He wanted, he, wanted, he wanted an answer. He wanted to get the job done. If they were going to say no, then he was going to go, go looking again. But Rebecca's family believed that he was sent by the Lord. Look at verse 50. And Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son, son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. Point 11. The servant had urgency to accomplish his mission. He, it's, just, it's just something he had to do. Verse 54. And they did eat and drink, and he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. They wanted Just give us ten more days to enjoy our, our, our sister and our daughter. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, as don't hold me back, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go unto my master. So he, he wasn't messing around. Point number 12. The servant was more concerned about getting his mission accomplished and pleasing his master than, than he was with his own pleasure, eating, drinking, and relaxing. Because it would have been really easy to say, oh, man, to start bringing out the barbecue and start bringing out the meat and start bringing out some vegetables and, and just all the, 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 the good drink and food. It would have been really easy to say, oh, man, this is awesome. Just eating, drinking, relaxing, spend another day there, eat, drink, relax, spend another day just relaxing it up. But he's like, nope, I want to get the job done. I want to get my master's son's uh, wife to him. In verse 58, And they called Rebekah and said unto him, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. So she had to make her own decision. She said, I will go. So she had to have faith that, that God, that it was God's will for her to go. So could you imagine if you were Rebecca, a beautiful young virgin, and you had to leave your mom and dad behind. You had to leave all your brothers behind. You had to leave all your friends behind. You had to leave your, 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 your family behind, you, you know, all your relatives and all, everything you knew, she had to leave it behind. And she would have to hop up on a camel, her and her maids, and ride away with these men that she had never met before. So you can imagine, that's, that's a big step of faith. Verse 58, And Rebecca rose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and went his way. So she was willing to follow him. Point 13. The servant accomplished his mission. Fill in the blank was accomplished. Verse 30, 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening tide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. So you could imagine Isaac. He was probably like praying the whole time. He was probably praying. He says, God, please. Answer my father's prayer. Answer my prayer. Give me a wife, oh God. And when he saw those camels coming, he probably just saw the dust at first. And then all of a sudden he says, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten camels. That's got to be them. And this, as they got closer, I'm sure his heart was probably beating. Beating like crazy. 
because he might his his future wife might have been there with might have been there, but then again, she might not have been coming either. So he didn't know, but you could imagine how excited he was to think that maybe my wife is there. Now let's look at verse fifty. Uh, let's go to verse sixty-four. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant said, had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And a veil was a symbol of modesty and obedience. Because that's just the kind of woman that she was. And she wanted to keep herself covered until the wedding. And, verse 66, And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So that's when they got married. When he took her into the tent, she became his wife. And uh, I, could, I could imagine that they were both super, super happy. They were both they were both they were both really blessed, spiritually speaking. <laughs> but 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 seriously, they were, they were both had been really happy because Isaac had his answers prayer his prayers answered, and Isaac and, and Rebecca she probably thought okay, this is my this is my man of God for my life, and God is going to bless my life in an amazing way. Now. One interesting in, in this chapter, it never says, it never even says the name of the servant. Most of the time, it has Bible names, all of you, you know, all the different Bible names. But in the whole chapter, not even one time does it even say his his name. It may say somewhere else, I don't know. But in this chapter, it didn't even mention the servant's name one time, and that's probably because he was more concerned about what his master wanted than what he wanted. His whole Life was dedicated to be a servant to his master. Now, let me tell you this, that Jesus was a servant. Philippians 2, 5 through 7, if you want to try to keep up with these, got a few more verses. Uh, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Can you imagine Jesus Christ? The God of the universe just wanted to be a servant. He took the form of a servant. I think if he did that, I think we could do that. What did Jesus say about being a servant? Matthew twenty twenty seven, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. It says if you want to be the most important person in God's economy, then you want to be a, you want to be a servant. And the nice thing about being a servant is, is each and every one of us can do that. Not everybody can come up and preach a sermon. Not everybody can do all kinds of great things. Not everybody can uh, do amazing things. But every single one of us can be a servant. Every one of us can serve our family, can serve our children, can serve our, our, our spouses, can serve our friends, can serve our pastor. And most importantly of all, each and every one of us can serve the Lord. King David, before he killed Goliath, he said, he said uh, in, in 1 Samuel 17, 32, And David said unto Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So David, before he was a king, he said he was King Saul's servant. Jude, in Jude 1, 1, it says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, when he, when he wrote 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. James, when he wrote James, in the book of James, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like the very first thing that these guys wanted to be known for is being a servant. All these prophets and all these uh, preachers. Moses, verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. I mean, even in his own house, he was a servant. Moses, 
the man that one of the men that was closest to God was a servant, even to his own family. Paul the Apostle wrote in Titus 1 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul and Timotheus in Philippians 1 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. And then I'm coming to the end here, Ephesians 6 6. We should be servants of Christ. And it says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So I'm just going to review our points. Number one, a servant is trustworthy. Number two, a servant has God's presence and blessing in his life. Number three, a servant takes his vows seriously. Number four, a servant is trusted with money and material goods. Number five, a servant is a person of prayer. Number six, a servant wants the best for his master and leader. Number seven, number seven, a servant is a hard worker, motivated, and wants to get the job done as quick as possible. Number eight, a servant has the right priorities. Number nine, the servant uh, let them know that the Abraham was a, a man very close to God and told him about his mission. Number ten, the servant was focused on his mission. Number eleven, the servant had urgency to accomplish his mission. Number twelve, the servant was more concerned about his mission than his own pleasure. Number 13, the servant accomplished his mission. Now let me ask you this, ladies and gentlemen. The servant, the, the sermon is over. But knowing that each and every one of us can be a servant to God and we could serve others, how many of you would like to be a servant? How many of you would like to serve God and would like to serve your family? And would like to serve your loved ones. How many of you would like to serve your pastor? How many of you would like to be a servant? And I know that to God, to Jesus, and to our pastor, one of the most important things that he is looking for is he wants us to be soul winners. God wants us to be soul winners. He wants me and you as servants to tell people about Jesus. In this church, we have a lot of opportunities. Once a month, we'll meet on a Saturday. First, first Sunday of the month, we'll meet on a Saturday, and we'll go soul winning. If you can go, we'd love to have you. 10 o'clock. Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock, we go soul winning. Matter of fact, I went this last, uh, last Tuesday morning, and I had a chance to talk to a uh, gentleman by the name of Emilio. He, he had been in, the, in prison from the time he was 17 years old, and he was in prison about 35 years. And about two years ago, somebody went to the prison and told him about Jesus. And Emilio accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. So for 35 years, he couldn't get out of prison. They meet at the bar and they say, nope, nope, you cannot go. You're not fit for society. But the good news is he got saved. And by the grace of God, when he went before that board after his salvation, they could tell that Emilio was a new man because he had Jesus Christ in his heart. God made the difference in his life. And now Emilio is a free man and he's doing really good and pray that he'll be able to come to church this coming Sunday. He was a, he's an awesome man. Another thing that God wants us to do is to disciple. Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's talking about soul winning and it's also talking about discipling. And then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So if you have not been discipled yet, I would urge you, get discipled. It doesn't matter how old you are. I was 57 years old and, and 56 years old before I, uh, or 56 or 57, one of the two. 56 years old before I started uh, discipling somebody. And it's really awesome. I have really enjoyed it. Now some of my best friends in the church are people that I've discipled. And you get to eat food with people. You get to pray with people. You get to build a friendship. But that's what discipleship is all about. we got a book. So if you want to get discipled or you want to be discipled, talk to me. And I'll set you up with somebody. It'll change your life. And I've, I've noticed that those who get discipled are usually the ones that are, start growing in the Lord. You see them start serving the Lord. And then you'll see them start discipling other people. So that's all we ask is for you to do what the Bible says, to be a servant.
each and every one of us can be a 